Um, so I'm going to read um, from Eat We Both Starve, um, which came out in 2021 and um, is literally the manifestation of my dreams coming true. So um, it's a very special object as well as what's inside. The fact that it exists at all is, is very um, lovely. It's a lovely thing. Um, so I'm going to start off with, of course, a poem about Cork. We're set in Cork. My Cork people, they're always legion. Um, my dad was really pleased. He wasn't really pleased because he's passed away. <laughs> <laughs> I was really pleased when I saw the cover and I knew my dad would have been really pleased because he was a huge Cork man in every respect. And this is the blood and bandage, as you know, the color, that's what he used to say, that the red and white was the blood and bandage of Cork. So I think Cork and France in that respect, being rebels of sorts, have a lot in common which I'm learning every day that is even more um, the case. So this is set in um, the English market in Cork, which reminds me of this area so much with all the beautiful markets and um, all of the beautiful stalls. Um, I like to call it my vegetarian origin story because I became a vegetarian when I was six, the most annoying child in the world. Um, but my mother was incredibly um, understanding, I thought, meat. I sucked marrow from bones at dinner, my father's face a bloody grin of pride. I ate liver in chunks for breakfast, pink and firm, jewels to adorn my insides. I gloried in the feel of flesh, the exertion of the chew. Holding my mother's hand in the English market, I saw them, turkey chandeliers, plucked, bruised purple eyelids, dainty light bulbs. Their smell, fresh as the insides of my mouth. Mother stroked my hair, they're there. I refused to eat meat, became pillowy, meek. She hid muscle under mashed potato. I tasted its tang in soup. Eat up, my parents said. I could not swallow. My skin, goose pimple yellow, doctors drew blood in tiny, regular sips. Teeth turned to glass and shattered in my mouth. All I could taste was blood. So yes, a charming child, <laughs> very easy to raise. Um, and in fairness, when I was a vegetarian first, East Cork certainly had not been introduced to the chickpea by that stage, so that transformed everything. Um, I'm very lucky in that I grew up by the sea and I live in Tralee by the sea. And the sea is always something that um, is very much part of my understanding of place. And I was always obsessed as a child, and indeed even still, um, to find a message in a bottle. That's my ultimate goal. <laughs> on any beach visit, I'm like, this is going to be the time. My grandfather, apparently, um, as legend would have it, found a giant barrel of vinegar once. So <laughs> I haven't found anything of interest except a shoe. So this is one day I did, though, however, find this. Beach whale. At first, I thought that enormous lump of red brown on the sand was the trunk of some ancient washed up tree. It was only when I mounted the object, digging my small hands into something far too pliable, that it really hit me. The stale smell of a thousand low tides and the mute open mouths of the many onlookers with their hysterical dogs, the seagulls circling like squalling clouds, my mother's curlew scream as she ran towards me, disjointed. A stride the whale like this, looking at my mother move through dimensions, planes of distance. I thought of boutique dressing rooms brimming with clothes and tension, like gas expanding. And of two little girls watching their mother cry at her reflection distorted in a fluorescent mirror. The weight of her past made flesh on her hips, 
the scars of our arrivals barely healed after all this time. My blind hands all over the body, grasping, desperate to hold on to something real, not knowing what that was. I dedicated this book to my mother, um, who is much more comfortable with that now than she was initially when it came out. So who would have a poet for a daughter, really? It's quite the uh, roller coaster. Um, I'm really bad at taking selfies. Uh, I find them really awkward and difficult, but I'm obsessed with other people's selfies. And indeed, in some way, obsessed with how I choose to project myself um, when I take selfies. Um, I have a very malleable face, and that is often captured <laughs> by other people. But when I take my own face, I want it to be like extremely Im immobile. Um, and I'm just really interested in that dichotomy and, and the way that we all choose to represent ourselves in selfies. And over the lockdown, that obsession became a little bit intense. <laughs> Selfie. Sitting alone in the house, eating my fingernails, watching the sky move away. The room is full. Versions of me crouching on the floor, balancing on the windowsill, reclining on the pouch of my lower lip, asleep in the crease of my eyelid. Not alone, with myself, a snare I have been running from. I do not live the way humans are supposed to. Compare my face to others you know. I fall short, an embarrassing fringe. No matter what face I try on, it's exhausting. All versions shake our heads. There is much to do until we think we are not what we are, Victoria's. I see those letters written on envelopes I know are for me because of the shape of that word, that greedy V. It's two arms open wide, ready to accept anything. Um, this is one of my favourite poems to read out, mostly because it's also in some way about Cork. Um, I'm from Cork, in case I didn't make that clear. <laughs> and um, I went to an all-girls Catholic school, and they have some friends in that. And usually in all-girls Catholic schools in Ireland, as we probably know, there's a, a boys' school conveniently next door. <laughs> Not in our case, <laughs> which was... Very cruel because another girls' school and boys' school were in the other town, so we were just in splendid isolation. Um, and the other schools referred to us as the Virgin Megastore, <laughs> <laughs> which was unfortunately outrageously true. And I think that did something <laughs> to my brain. Um, because instead of actually having any sort of real friendship or relationship with actual boys, um, I became obsessed with the men in my history books, um, who, in fairness, were all, as we would say, in Cork, flas. <laughs> and particularly, I'm thinking, Michael Collins. <laughs> and I had a crush on WB8. I know, problematic, <laughs> but, you know, I was young. And still, occasionally, I think of him. Cork schoolgirl considers the GPO Dublin 2016. I'm standing outside the GPO in my school uniform, which isn't ideal. My uniform is the colour of bull's blood. In this year, I am 16, a pleasing symmetry, because I love history. Have I told you that? It is mine, so I carry it in my rucksack. I love all the men of history sacrificing themselves for Ireland, for me, these rebel Jesuses. I put my finger in the building's bullet holes, poke around in its wounds. I wonder if they feel it, those boys. I hope they do. Their blooming faces pressed flat in the pages of my books. I lick the wall 
as if it were a stamp, it tastes of bones, this smelly city, of those boys in uniforms, theirs bloody too. I put my lips to the pillar. I want to kiss them all. And I do. I kiss all those boys goodbye. Eiffel Tower erected itself in my head. We couldn't find the lift, climbed the stairs. Of course, there were fireworks. We stared at each other. Rare exhibits in the Louvre. You licked my Mona Lisa smile right off. Of course, we were both in imaginary Chanel. We drank warm cider and ate pancakes, yours flambéed. I got drunk my tights laddered on both legs. Of course, we experienced tachycardia at the Moulin Rouge. Our hotel, a boxed macaron on a navy boulevard, we spun around in the dark outside, rain dizzy. Of course, we slept at the Ritz. Our little room, tucked into the corner, a pink pocket you slipped into that night. Of course, our fingers hunted for change. In the mirrored elevator, I couldn't meet your eye. I crushed you into the laminated sample menu and died. Of course, it was only la petite mort. Oh, Paris. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read um, a few short ones and one longer one um, from the new book, which is coming out in February, which I've been um, working on EC and um, I think it's a, a continuation of the themes that I have been exploring in my work um, and this one was inspired by the fact that um, over lockdown my bed became a picnic spot, <laughs> a bouncing castle, a boat, um, really anything other than a place to sleep um, for my small lady, my daughter. And so I decided that I would treat myself and order a Super King bed. Um, I had never seen a Super King bed in a domestic setting before. And when it arrived, <laughs> I was alarmed by its vastness in my room. And being... I'm going to say a poet, I'm going to use that excuse. <laughs> Being a poet, this is what I thought of. <laughs> Super King, there is a corpse on our bed. It is Jesus, down from the cross. The blood spattered across his rippling torso, the crown of thorns ripping the pillow slip and the flesh on his forehead. I don't know why he is here with that heart exposed, his eyes closed. He is dead, I think, but you know how men can be. They say one thing, and the next thing you know, they're on the road showing off their open wounds, while back at home, the women weep. <coughs> Poor Jesus. <laughs> He's been through worse, in fairness. <laughs> um, I have become really, I, I'm a poet in residence in the Yeats Society and I've become, I've always been obsessed with Yeats and fancied him. Um, and then obviously discovered his more problematic aspects. Um, and I've always been really interested in his um, relationship with swans and I'm, I've had a long relationship with swans, <laughs> which some of my new book explores. Um, I had a pet swan when I was young in that I just picked a, a random swan <laughs> that I made friends with and would see every time I went anywhere. Interesting. Um, and I think this is like, you know, a, a poem I suppose that's dealing with um, miscarriage, but also I think more profoundly perhaps that notion of sometimes with things, no matter how hard you work on them, um, you don't get what you want and how to actually um, find some peace with that. The Wild Swans at the Wetland Centre. Just one swan, her perfect twin floating beneath a trick. She dips her beak into herself, 
hoping not to meet water, but the soft plumage of another. The incident described in detail by the centre staff, how her partner fell from the sky, crashed into the path, a mess, brains, blood, feathers, screams, a quick clean up. I wish I had been there. It is so colourless some days. Bereft and haunted, she lollops up the rocks to her island nest, gathers her neck into a sleeping S. We visit often. There is nothing else to do. Until one day, there are two. Her new partner has a strong, plump body, an insistent beak. He is very protective. We watch them for weeks. You scoot around the lake ahead of me, delighted by your newfound autonomy. Come spring and your birthday, they assemble an untidy heap of reeds and grass close to the water's edge, a present. The cob sits on the nest, guarding the precious orbs, while she feeds in cold water by the pedal boats, then incubates. She almost never leaves them. This morning, there was blood in the toilet water, I cannot seem to keep them. The cob hisses at toddlers and a knobbly need man. We worry, what if there is a flood or mink attack or that pointy heron standing sentry like on the bridge gets hungry? I'm afraid of what has happened. The swan's necks droop low. We watch our own water cells tag along until one day she's left the nest. No downy flock, no little brood. Nothing. I have nothing to show, kneeling at the lip of the lake alone in the evening, wringing my hands. I touch its cold body. They approach. We split on liquid, become part of each other, while broken slithers of street light and moon, unreachable in monochrome, repeat themselves over and over us and onto the water. Um, I'm just going to read two more. That's your two poem warning plaques then, which is always the best part of a poetry reading. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, thank God, it's nearly there. One is really short and one is slightly longer. Um, I'm a huge fan of Bjork, and particularly um, Bjork's take on poets, which is basically that we're all liars, <laughs> which is so true. Um, I also really admire her fashion sense and those of you who are aware of such things might remember her iconic dress that she wore to the Oscars which is like indelibly marked in my brain. Um, so this is um, for snazzy dressers everywhere. Bjork on Bjork's swan dress. They wrote about it like I was trying to wear a black Armani and got it wrong. Like I was trying to fit in. Of course, I wasn't trying to fit in. That's my Bjork poem. <laughs> um, and finally, I'm going to read um, a poem. Ram, um, I lived with someone who um, was a, is a um, wildlife ecologist. And so when I came home any given day, I was never sure of what I would find. Like literally, it could be, you know, a huge tray full of Petri dishes. Um, it could be a fish. Um, literally any sort of insect, animal, bone. Um, so one day I came home and I found this. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful, wonderful audience and amazing colleagues and compatriots over this month of May. The best month, obviously, to be in Paris. <laughs> um, and here's to meeting again. And we'll always have Paris. It's good to consider. Ram. It's on the kitchen table, the ram's skull. He came in cradling it in his arms. Don't worry, it's been dead for ages, he whispered, then touched my cheek, a circuit forming between him, me, and the ram that flooded my body with crackling winter fire. He plonked the skull down, before vanishing, as he does, into his head and left this head instead, still on the wood, just bone and horns. And oh, what horns. 
I imagine his admirer's eyes widening, dark slits expanding to take him all in. The curve of them, looping, intentional things, rigid, strong. I can't look for long, can't reach out to touch them, so it's all I want to do. To be honest, I am scared of the narrow, brittle skull between two magnificent coronets, just a sliver of bone, and in its empty sockets, a blank blackness. It is the devil, no doubt, here on our kitchen table like a vase, it vibrates. I can almost hear its ancient bleats every time I look around, make tea, load the dishwasher, stack plates. It is there, majestic in stasis, weird exhibit. I'll take it to show her, he says when he returns, meaning our two-year-old who has been asking about bones can smell death in the house. She runs in, her teething cheeks hot and red, Mama, the Baba doesn't need its head anymore. The three of us and the ram, its presence a whisper from the future, stubborn, yes, and unapologetic. It is on the table even now. Tomorrow it will disappear to his laboratory, but tonight I can't stop thinking about those hollow orbs, the thin fragments of skull clinging together to give shape to an idea. Ram, silhouetted against all the objects, against all the light. Ram, who am I supposed to be in all this? The floral blinds, the recipe books, the porcelain floor tiles. Oh, Ram, let us bash our heads off them and weep.